Well, good evening to each and every last one of you. Welcome to I Teach Tuesday. Well, tonight we're going to do things a little bit different. As most of you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so as the Second Missionary Baptist Church family and the servant leader of this great ministry, it is my prerogative to make sure that we keep matters of our mental health abreast. And so tonight we have an amazing special guest along with one of our very own that will be sharing with you tonight, discussing topics centered around mental health awareness. Why don't you in the comments section, Facebook land, YouTube land, go ahead and welcome our very own Minister Jeremy Sturdivant, who by, by, by vocation also serve as a counselor in the mental health field, and also Mr. Richard Crabb, who is also a licensed therapist in the mental health arena as well. Go ahead and welcome both of these amazing men tonight as they share topics and discuss things that can help you and benefit your life. And while you're in it, hit the like and the share button so that someone else can be informed on tonight. God bless you. Good evening, good evening. Uh, welcome you all that have tuned in tonight. We give God Amen. glory for this opportunity um, mm -hmm. to bring awareness to mm -hmm. mental health. My name is Minister Jeremy Sturdivant, and this gentleman right here to uh, my left or right, I'm not sure yeah. how you see it, mm -hmm. uh, is Mr. Krebs. I'll give him the opportunity to introduce himself. Go ahead, sir. Hey guys, uh, first off, thank you guys so much to Brother Sturdivant and Brother Simpson for having me tonight. It's definitely honored and humble to be here. Uh, my name is Richard Krebs. I'm an LPC and certified in EMDR therapy. And I work um, in a private practice setting, uh, Warrior Wellness Group in Alabaster, Alabama. Thank you again for coming on and uh, uh, just sharing your knowledge with us and um, helping me to bring awareness to uh, just those that are viewing right now, viewers and as well as our congregation. We are blessed and we thank you for coming. Yeah, absolutely. If you would, just guys that are with me right now, please join us in prayer. We're going to open up with prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this hour, Father. We ask and pray that the things of study that is needed to be poured out to your people be recalled back to our remembrance, that questions be asked uh, so that answers may be brought forth that may help your people, all that are viewing in this hour and this time, Father. And we ask, God, that you get the blessings, that you get the glory and the honor for all things that we do on your behalf in truth and sincerity. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I would be remiss if I didn't think, give thanks and honor to the, the angels of the house, uh, Pastor Devon and Lady mm -hmm. Chelsea Simpson. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, come before your people, the congregation and the people that are viewing uh, to take this moment to bring awareness to mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just get right into it, brother. Right, um, had a good conversation with him. Mm -hmm. uh, really good guy, people. Um, so. Mr. Krebs, can you tell us what is mental health in your words? So basically, uh, mental health, the way in which I describe it, is basically the condition, condition, of, condition of your mind, but also I think in some aspects it can be also the condition of your heart. Mm -hmm. And I think really um, important to identify, you know, all of, all of you who are watching will watch. I don't know if you guys are recording this or not. But if you are comprehending what I'm saying right now, if you have a brain, then you also have mental health. And it's very important in which you do take care of it and manage it well, you know, not just for the sake of yourself, but also for the sake of those around you. Because I think oftentimes too, like with mental health, like I've heard, you know, some clients, family members tell the clients, it's like, hey, it's all in your head. Yes, but it's all, but how it comes out is like through your words, your actions and behaviors. So, you know, whatever's going on externally, you know, not just as we, uh, listen, as is preached, and like we read ourselves in the Bible, like what happens out here is a condition of what's in here in our hearts, mm -hmm. but also it can be also what's the condition of our minds. So very important that we manage and take care of that. Definitely, definitely. Uh, mental health is a, I guess, I think we're a conglomerate of many things. Yeah. Uh, we have, I like, I brought about that video early because it showed people in settings that we mm -hmm. normally would go through ourselves in a natural everyday settings, but you saw their head in a frenzy. Yeah. Um, and most of us right now, we've passed somebody we've taken for granted. Mm -hmm. We've even had moments ourselves when our heads felt just like that picture that was depicted, that frenzy mm -hmm. going on with multiple thoughts, multiple emotions, um, just not even giving 
thought to how we are and our total way of being and our stability. Mm -hmm. um, cognition, you mentioned something about the brain. Can you tell us how mental il illnesses and mental health can mm -hmm. impair our cognition or understanding? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and even like, even if we like break it down to like some at aspects of anxiety, for me, like what I like to tell clients a lot of times is like anxiety loves to live in the what ifs. Most of the time it's negative what ifs. Like if it was positive what ifs, that'd be like daydreaming. Like, so like, let's say like you were wanting to open a business, you know, like, let's say this is like baseline, like we'll see what happens. Negative what ifs, positive, you know, opening business. What if I fail? What if I go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. Anxious. What if I succeed? What if it, I get to build like many businesses? Oh, that's nice. Not really anxiety there. But I think especially like in like preparing for the what ifs, oftentimes what we can kind of find ourselves is like trying to mentally prepare for the worst case scenario when really what that does a lot of times is it places a lot of like mental and emotional energy that needed. One thing that I talk with a lot of clients on with anxiety and the what ifs, it's focusing on what is. So like what is concrete, you know, like let's say like how, like let's say a person has a family history of like heart related issues like so where a negative way of there could be what if i have a heart attack okay grounding yourself to what is what is right now what is concrete what am i doing to make sure that i have good heart health am i dieting well am i exercising well am i drinking enough water what am i what is concrete what is right now what am i doing right now so that i can be proactive in what i'm doing that way i avoid the negative what ifs Definitely, definitely. You yeah, gave a lot of tools in that. I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, and especially in that too. Like with the um, with the cognitions, I think we can definitely have like faulty or like negative cognitions of about you know situations that could occur, things that are happening, our own selves, like our own core beliefs, our own sense of self worth and meaning and purpose. And I think in that too, like especially with self worth, like the way in which we view ourselves has a significant impact on the way in which we view what happens in the world around us. I like what you brought up. I want to um, touch on that subject right there. Yeah, you said absolutely. something earlier about the physical adaptations, how one can have uh, maybe uh, diabetes or weak heart or uh, arrhythmia. Yeah. Um, physiological standpoint from an aspect of us knowing that we have some physical adaptations mm -hmm. or uh, problems um, that there can be mental emotional thoughts about that that creates uh, illnesses or create help create behavior patterns um there is even empirical evidence shown that you know a person can have uh these thoughts and the actual the body will start adapting to the behaviors based upon those thoughts yes. that, that are that are had yeah um, you also mentioned one thing earlier about anxiety mm -hmm. uh, anxiety is probably one of the most prevalent uh, common mental illnesses or disorders, um, along with depression and um, depression and PTSD. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Can you elaborate on what that looks like? Give us some symptoms of anxiety and PTSD. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So oftentimes with um with anxiety, like it can be, you know, a lot of times like the overthinking, like catastrophizing thing or the worst case scenario, like overthinking like you know like let's say somebody let's say like we're, you know we're in church on sundays and like somebody kind of gives you like the little side eye stuff like that you know we can we could <laughs> overthink and be like oh so and so is mad at me like they don't like what i'm wearing stuff like that to where what's concrete what is she just looked at you like that's literally all the hard evidence that's all the concrete evidence we have <laughs> we can kind of overthink overthink ourselves like oh there's something wrong with me but um other symptoms of anxiety could be um kind of like nervousness, kind of trembling or shaking. I know you mentioned like the physio physiological stuff too of like the breathing, stuff like that. You know, mm -hmm. kind of one cheat code to a lot of anxiety and like coping skills is like deep breathing. Mm -hmm. For oftentimes too, I know for me, like when I've been anxious recently and kind of in the past, like I notice my breathing is like kind of fairly shallow, like <laughs> during that too, like, and obviously the brain needs oxygen to function, but also really help with rational thought to where, if we're not giving our brain the oxygen that it needs, then we're not able to challenge like those negative cognitions or thoughts. And then um, some other aspects, um, you know, like sweating, trembling, shaking, uh, feeling like nervous on edge, kind of that indigestion too. And I think I like what you said earlier, like 
sometimes our own emotions, our own cognitions could then in turn play effect on our physical symptoms. So in that too, like let's say, um, like let's say like a student or somebody's like taking a test or has a really big engagement um, coming up to where if they, you know, the breathing's not good and like they're just overly anxious, that could cause some like stomach distress, some indigestion, like r- rapid breathing, sweating and all this other stuff too. It's where it's like take a deep breath, take a deep breath in, then outs, you know, hey, you know, just and even kind of, we can be our own hype man for the better or the worse of ourselves. Like, you know, being the own, our own hype person for the worst could be like, man, like you're going to mess up. You're going to fail. Like it's going to go horrible. So I think we can really try to mentally prepare for how everything could go horrible, but we got to see both sides of the coin and kind of give ourselves a chance. So like, okay, well, how could this be successful? How could this go well? And I think, you know, I know some people talk about man- manifestation and stuff like that, but, um, and I think there is like bloody to that to some degree, but I think also in that too, just with those cognitions, just like, Hey, you're here, you've prepared, you're ready, and out. Like that, just kind of like, hey, it's okay to be still in this moment. You know, we're going to get through this. There will be, whatever this current trial is, there, you know, there will be an end to it. So just trust that the next season, the end of this current trial is coming. I like the way you, uh, you put that, uh, what you said, um, um, you, 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 you alluded to having, having how a lot of anxiety or, uh, the problems that we have is due to lack of structure, mm-hmm. uh, crisis mm-hmm. happens when we don't have structure. So it's mm-hmm. better to be proactive and have a plan of execution when it happens. That's why, uh, it's very important for we to know ourselves and be honest with ourselves mm-hmm. and expose and write down and annotate our triggers. What mm-hmm. makes us have these moments? Uh, yeah. Pastor teaches us a lot to like, write down uh, things that we re- remember, especially during dreams. But mm-hmm. I, you should also write down things that aggravate you, that, mm-hmm. that may yeah. push you to the limit. So therefore you're able to recognize and be proactive in planning how to deal with it mm-hmm. as it comes because crisis come when we don't have a structure. So how do we implement a structure uh, to combat anxiety uh, or maybe nervousness. I remember I'll share this tad, tidbit, which is being transparent. As a mm-hmm. minister, I cannot do, well, I have had trouble because mm-hmm. I can't do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. I've had trouble yeah. preaching a five minute uh, sermon. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I did it doing uh, Jacob's well training, I had a conniption fit. Mm-hmm. Anxiety was not my friend. However, I learned to breathe through my nose and out through my mouth and to keep my physiological body Mm -hmm. still, even though I may have been crazy and frantic in the inside. Teach us, give us some tidbits on how we uh, counteract those uh, anxieties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think especially kind of with what you mentioned too, like let's say like you got like some kind of big speech or something coming up. Um, one thing, cause I think a lot of times too, like when our minds just kind of like race and race and go and nonstop, it can be, we can like branch off into like every possible like scenario and stuff like that, that could go wrong or that could happen. We're trying to like, again, mentally prepare for it. But I think one thing, again, kind of go with what's concrete, what's present. Um, some aspects like with the deep breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, I think that's huge. Um, also kind of grounding. So, um, one thing that I've done with clients before is kind of a four, three, two, one. So, what are uh, four things that you see, three things that you physically feel, like touch, um, two things that you can like hear, one thing that you can like smell or taste. Um, and I think kind of in that too, it helps bring them to the current moment, to the current environment, and, you know, kind of reels them in from whatever the 20 different scenarios that could be playing out. Because I think especially with that too, um, with all of those scenarios that our brain is thinking of, ultimately one thing's going to happen in the end. Mm -hmm. So ultimately one thing's going to happen in the end. So it's not helpful for us to let our mind go and try to, you know, uh, pre cope with 20 to 30 things that may never happen. Wow. I want to hit on what you just said, pre cope, because many of us deal with things by coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of what coping mechanisms in and how we do so when we have uh, Mm -hmm. little minor illnesses or distractions or disorders? Uh, I know one thing I could put out right now is we like the, the nip on the bottle. Do I? Right, <laughs> the, tell, tell me more about that. Take, to take a sip of the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
yeah, so we're kind of in that too, like that engages the senses, not just taste, but also that cooling sensation. Mm-hmm. Um, some other aspects too. One, um, one that I learned when I was working in addiction, it's called a box breathing. So what box breathing is, it's like the same count you breathe in is the same count you bring out. So mm-hmm. like, let's say you do a breath count in. Out. And um, I think... I, I could be completely wrong in this, but when I was learning it, uh, the guy that taught me it told me that it was like originally like a military technique for like snipers, where mm-hmm. they would like run to their spot and then to kind of set set their heart rate for the shot. They would do that box breathing to regulate their heart rate from the running. And I think um, some other aspects in that too um, could be like let's say like you're like you're at home feeling anxious or just out and about getting kind of a cool rag and like putting it on like your forehead or kind of your neck. That way the temperature kind of helps, helps kind of bring some of that breathing down, but also kind of cools you down. Cause oftentimes with anxiety and stuff like that too, it can bring about, like I said, the sweating, but also like an elevated, uh, elevated body temperature. Cause it's like you're just emotionally kind of getting heated up per se. Mm-hmm. Any, any kind of cool activity movements, you know, like, for some of you guys, like, I know I've done it a lot of times too. If there's been like a very stressful or like anxiety provoking like phone conversation that you've had with somebody, like you don't just like sit there and like just talk about how everything's like going on. Like you oftentimes like pace around doing like random tasks or just pacing back and forth to where in that too, um, we just one kind of concept with EMDR as well. It's like movement helps, lo- helps lower the distress. That's correct. Okay. So, um, what is the difference between a mental health illness versus a disorder? And tell us a little bit about the difference between a counselor and a therapist. Yeah. So, so I think with mental health and and disorders, uh, oftentimes they can be used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. I think with the illness aspect, I think it, at least what I read, I think the mental illness aspect can sometimes focus more on the like physiological stuff, like the chemical Mm-hmm. imbalances and stuff like that that are common with it and disorder is more so related to like the you know cognitions thoughts and behaviors correct there's some that it can be yeah. done with long-term yeah. therapy versus right. more exactly. of acute with a uh, diagnosable mm-hmm. uh psychiatrist giving you more of a, a, a psychotropic or some nature to help you uh deal with it some type of uh, mm-hmm. uh prescription yeah yeah absolutely and I think especially and with a counselor and therapist, like for me personally in my practice, I use them interchangeably. Mm-hmm. I'm a counselor, I'm a therapist, tomato, tomato. Mm-hmm. Uh for some people, for some people they see counselors as more of so dealing with the right now and then therapists dealing more with the past and like mental disorders. But for me, like I I, I call myself either because I think when I introduce myself as a therapist to some people, it's like, oh, call it respiratory therapist. And yeah. I'm like, no, mental therapist. And they're like, oh. Yeah, the eyes get a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I like send them the bill and it's fine. No, I'm just gonna do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, sometimes like you get mental therapists and they're like, "Are they analyzing me right now?" I'm like, "I'm off the clock, so we're good." So wow. yeah, yeah, I, you're good. I, I've had that said a lot in yeah. uh, just in, in a around of what, what my people and my family are. Yeah. Um. Yes, I definitely look at counselor being as a more acute thing, a short term mm-hmm. versus therapy is a long term thing. Yeah. I want to make that point to be very, very uh, aware, make that conscious of everybody's knowledge mm-hmm. that therapy uh, is not just a short term thing, but a long term mm-hmm. thing. You can go to a therapist just to go talk. Mm-hmm. I myself see therapists. Therapists see therapists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, pastor always made the uh, comment that uh, anything uncovered is spoiled. A pastor needs mm-hmm. a pastor. People need therapists. Yeah. Um, there's right. a big stigma, especially in the African American community, mm-hmm. um, that anybody that sees uh, a therapist or a clown counselor, clinician, whatever you want to call them, has a problem. You don't have to have a problem. You mm-hmm. just can want to talk about uh, structure. You want to talk about the day and the stressful day that you had. You just may uh, want somebody to give you encouragement and maybe mm-hmm. want to take the feminist approach about some things. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use that oh, term. Good. Oh, um, good. So, therapists yeah. are, 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 are there for multiple mm-hmm. areas of focus. Can you elaborate just on uh, uh, some? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, so kind of in my experience, like so far, like I've seen children all the way through like, you know, the whole lifespan essentially. And I think 
a lot of people that I, a lot of people I see are like kind of standard anxiety and depression. Some are uh, marital issues, trauma, you know, overwhelmed parents who are trying to figure out if they're doing this parenting thing right and just really need the emotional help and support there. Like some need just help with like everyday life transitions or just everyday stressors and just kind of someone to talk to and kind of unbiased. Um, and I think one thing that's very important too, um, it, it's funny, but like you, as I'm sure Red Servant, like as a therapist, you kind of ran into this as well. Um, like <laughs> shopping may be therapeutic for some people, but mm -hmm. it's not your therapist. Like um, chopping wood may be therapeutic, but it's not your therapist. You know, your, your spouse is not your therapist. Your friend is not your therapist. Your child is not your therapist. Mm -hmm. Please don't put the children in. <laughs> um, and um, this, you know, your, pa your pastor is not your therapist. Mm. Your pastor is your pastor. Mm. Now, now, like some could engage in like Christian counseling and pastoral counseling, and that's another thing. Mm -hmm. But if they're just your pat, you know, if they are, if they're not your therapist, it's okay to get a therapist. And I think one thing, especially with um, mental illness disorder and like being in in the body of Christ as well, the presence of mental illness being absent in his favor, like that, those Amen. can oftentimes definitely coexist. And I think especially with that too, like, you know, and one thing I'll say, like for some people, like they, they've had like a bad, like initial experience or like an ex a bad experience with um, therapy in general. Kind of, and one thing that I would, if you have tried therapy before and like for whatever it didn't work, I would ask you two questions. One, did there, you know, if you say therapy didn't, did not work, did you not work in therapy? Mm. Or also too, was the therapist just not a good fit? Because I think in that too, like if the therapist wasn't a good fit, I encourage you to do like you do to food. Like if you don't, if, if a one really person isn't really your taste or you feel like you click with, if, if you need the help, try somebody else. Like there's a lot of different therapists, a lot of different styles, especially in the Birmingham, greater Birmingham area. Wow. So many, so many therapists and like options for mental health care. And I think especially, I'm going to say this, like you mentioned, like the stigma in the black community. Mm -hmm. I know for me as a heterosexual white male, life life has been kinder to me than it has for the black community over the past years and really the past lifetime. So mm -hmm. I definitely want to acknowledge the privilege that I've got as a, you know, white male and like maybe the lack of stigma to some things. So I definitely want to, you know, I'm not just <laughs> I I'm naive to a degree because I'm not of African American race and like experience, but I do definitely under, you know, from what I can understand and see, especially with the stigma, like you don't have to be, you don't have to be silent. There are safe places. There are safe people in which you can um, figure out life and the everyday problems and stuff with. I agree. Um, yeah. You don't have to there. You can still be a good clinician and mm -hmm. not share the same experiences as long as you have yeah. uh, ethical practice yes. practices sympathy and empathy and elite and and allow the client to lead and, and you take them to and, and develop the tools mm -hmm. that are needed them to have yeah. you you can do anything there are a lot of great coaches who've never played the game of basketball mm -hmm. to stop them winning from championship yeah. right it doesn't stop them from winning mm -hmm. um i like the fact that you brought out you said that you know therapists are like eating food or trying food their mm -hmm. preferences um there is a way that you should go about seeking therapists yeah. you can ask your therapist a question Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, um, I, I really do believe that my faith, the Bible, mm -hmm. God and science can be intertwined. Yeah. I'm going to always use, uh, the Bible as my guideline mm -hmm. first and foremost. And then my science, I believe that all sciences came from the Bible. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, if I believe that and I'm a therapist and you believe that and you're the therapist mm -hmm. and somebody else believe that the therapist, then you have multiple different choices, but you have to shop around. Yeah, you can absolutely. go and interview your therapist just mm -hmm. like you interview a person that you're about to employ. Because rapport is right. very important between mm -hmm. therapist and client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. absolutely. And I, and I think kind of in that too, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, like I've had people who have, come to me before like they figure out like i'm not a good fit for them for whatever reason and then they just cancel and don't say anything 
Mm-hmm. Um, or like they feel like, I don't want to hurt the therapist's feelings. I tell my clients all the time, if you if you find a way to hurt my feelings, I'm going to congratulate you because that is a hard thing to do. But I think <laughs> but, I, but I think in that too, it's like whatever whatever you have to do to reach the best state of spiritual, emotional, and mental wellness for yourself, mm-hmm. do that unapologetically. Yeah. Be, be kind, be respectful, of course. But but in that too, go you know go get go pursue your wellness. Okay, because yeah. I think especially like, and not just like as men, but also I imagine you know, along with the stigma in the black community, wanting to keep everything like in-house. Mm. So in a sense too, like, I mean, there's only so much you can keep in-house in yourself before it starts busting out the seams and I, to where you're doing damage control because we're not taking good enough care of ourselves and then we're just overflowing the dysfunction and the turmoil within us onto other people. Wow. Yes. Uh, man, you, you said a mouthful there, especially yeah. in the African-American community. Mm-hmm. We like to sweep a lot of things underneath the rug. Right. And there's a lack of communication. Mm-hmm. Communication is a strong, strong tool, mm-hmm. uh, especially in uh, uh, between the client and uh, clinician. However, it needs to be uh, inscrewed and instructed and, and, and uh, modeled in the household. And uh, lack of communication mm-hmm. is one of the main components in which the reasoning why we have so many illnesses, um, mm-hmm. because nobody likes to talk. Um, many of our uh, illnesses are past bio, psycho, psycho and social mm-hmm. environment. Can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit about the bio, psycho and social uh, yeah, yeah. environment? Absolutely. Yeah, with um, oh, I guess we'll talk about so like with some biological aspects like especially like with addiction like let's say like there's like a family history of addiction like in one's family there are with that there's like some genetic predispositions not saying that addiction will occur but let's say a person has a genetic predisposition and they start experimenting with uh certain things to where kind of in that too it puts them at a greater disadvantage and more likelihood for addiction because of that family history and I think especially um, with the psychological aspects, similar to like with anxiety and depression, not saying that just because I had a father with depression means I will have depression. It just means that genetically and biologically, I'm more predisposed to it. And um, I think especially with the uh, social as well, you know, you know, I'm sure we've all heard the phrase in some aspect or way of like, you are who you, you are, who you hang out with. Mm-hmm. But I think kind of in that too, um, to, who we hang out with and the and the type of treatment and interactions we tolerate from those people, me personally, I feel like I can have a, a great reflection on who we who we perceive ourselves to be and what we perceive our work to be. Mm. So, and what I mean by that is, like, let's say, um, let's say, like, you are, let's say, like, you're the people pleaser, you're the yes man, because you, because God, God forbid, like, you make somebody upset or they feel some type of way about you a word that i use in therapy a lot people get butt hurt yeah so i think so i think kind of in that too is like if i let people walk all over me and like do whatever they want with me and to me then there is a pretty good chance that that i don't feel good about myself Mm -hmm. because if i felt good about myself if i saw the value i had in myself then i would not tolerate some of the things which that are being done to me because i value myself more than the way in which i've been treated and I think especially like for anybody watching who's like experienced like a lot of like toxic and like negative things from other people, and especially those who may have experienced trauma, you know, you are, you know, you are worth more than the way that some other people have treated you. Amen. Yeah, I, I really, I really want to express that and hear that. Like your, you know, your value is not determined by the actions of others. Your, your worth is determined by the one who created you by God himself. Amen. Because even and one thing I tell people too, like with worth too, is like, um, like think of it like when we were babies, like we were cute, we were adorable, but also we could give, we could not give anything. And even like this is kind of an example I use with my non spiritual, non religious clients as well. It's like, so literally all you could give to the world is like your, you you eat, poop, you sleep, repeat. You give nothing to the world. You just you just make a mess, make a mess of your surroundings because you're a baby. But I think in that too, in the love in which hopefully, you know, your parents, like your loved ones, caregivers and stuff like that, God himself, when you could give nothing, 
he gave everything. Mm-hmm. For in that too, and even God's example through Christ Himself, and hopefully, you know, positive people in your life, they show you what your worth is in those actions, even if you don't see it in yourself yet. Wow. Yeah, that's very that's very powerful. You you talked about the parents. I wanna I wanna hit on the children um, and okay. how how we have to be very mindful because I'm a big thing of learned behavior, mm-hmm. nature versus nurture, operating yeah, yeah. conditioning, mm-hmm. um, reinforcement. We have to be careful how we communicate what we call them, name calling, because we induce trauma. I I believe, especially in the African American culture, that there is a lot of uh, dysfunction that we call function. Because yes. we believe it to be so because mother or father has reinstituted mm-hmm. or reinforced it in us. And we model it without giving thought to what or how we're impairing our generational seeds or the people right. around us. Because we teach them the behavior that was taught to us. Mm-hmm. How do we, um, that's why I, I stress honesty and core values mm-hmm. yeah. um, within my clients and um, playing the tape all the way throughout, through, through, uh, watching it. you know. And what I mean by playing the tape is, um, let's look at all of the surroundings. Let's do a genogram and, and mm-hmm. the group settings of people that you're attached to. Because you said that um, mom always told me if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. Um, association brings on si- a simulation. We got a duck. <laughs> and yeah, and we got a duck. Mm-hmm. And, and if that duck is feeding you, you are most likely mm-hmm. to become that type of duck. So mm-hmm. how, that is how yeah. trauma is transferred in many cases. Mm-hmm. Um can you give me a little example of how we can, I guess, disfigure that and give a different implementation to us uh, or strategy to combat it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's very complex, right? Because it's like a lot of different yeah, factors that <laughs> kind of like pile into it. Um, yes, sir. I think especially with, I think especially with the children, like especially like with those principles too, like because I've, I've talked with like, some parents on uh, like some of their like parenting principles that guide what they do and what they try to instill in the children. So like, let's say like honesty, respect, uh, kindness, courage, and stuff like that. To where it's like, Hey, if these, if these are the four, if these are the four staples of which I desire to model my family on, then my rules are going to flow from these principles. Mm-hmm. And I think especially um, with that, especially with, with kids, like um, often I was like, you know, we get on to them like, hey, no, we don't do that, stuff like that. We we acknowledge and we catch them doing wrong. But I think in that too, challenging parents to catch, you know, uh, this goes 100, this goes 30. So I got to translate it through the school zone. I'm I'm, um, sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> but in that too, is like catching them doing good. Because mm-hmm. I think, you know, especially with at least what I've found in my practice, like, especially with little girls, it's um like, hey, do you love me? Do you value me? Wow. With with little boys, you know, with boys, I know me, you know, right. when I was young myself is like, Hey, do you see me? Do you acknowledge me? Do you see what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. So, in, um, so I think in that too, it's like the way in which we communicate amongst our, us, ourselves as adults and like as parents, um, also how we communicate with others as kids. It's like, Hey, what, what is healthy? Cause like you mentioned like with the um, dysfunction, like, you know, what may have been your, you know, your perceived normal may not be normal. Correct. It's your normal because that's all you've ever known. That's all you're ever used to. Mm-hmm. But it's not, it's not healthy. Correct. Yeah. Definitely so. Um, I, want, I want to emphasize that we must deal with the issue yes. rather than the behavior. Because a lot yes. of times we go directly toward the behavior. Right. And then we punish you based upon the behavior and don't mm-hmm. communicate the issue or elaborate to the children or the adult what's wrong. Communication is a bulk of our mm-hmm. barriers because yeah. we don't communicate being vulnerable and honest right? Uh, and make we don't make decisions through our values. Mm-hmm. Most of the time we make decisions and communicate based upon what we can pre- what we can perceive or grasp. Can you yeah. can you deal with how important it is to deal with the issue rather than the behavior. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of in that too, one um, little word analogy I could kind of use very much with that concept is to like, the behavior is the what, mm-hmm. let's work on the why. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. where, and, uh, and I think especially with um, kids behavior too, like let's say, uh, 
I think. So there's this book called The Explosive Child, which anybody who's having um, behavioral issues with their kids, I highly recommend. It's a great book. And I think in that too, um, so like, let's say, for example, let's say, for example, like you take your kids to the playground, like, hey, like, you know, you know we'll call him Junior. Like, hey, Junior, it's time to leave. Junior pitches a fit. He is not having it. He is ready to stay on the, stay on the playground as long as he can. So we <laughs> see the what in being his tantrum. But mm-hmm. what's the why? The why could be he struggles with transitions. So we're kind of in that too. If we if we help work on him improving his ability to transition to and from place as well, then hopefully the what diminishes itself. And yeah. I think it, and I think even kind of in that too, um, like let's say the heat of like arguments or like disagreements, um, you know, so somebody's like talking over another one, so the other person shuts down. We see the what as them shutting down, but the why could be that they feel unheard and unheard and un- disrespected because mm-hmm. they're not having their time to speak and have their voice heard to which in turn just re- repeats the pattern of shutting down. Like I should just keep it in myself. Mm-hmm. So I think in that too, like, you know, it's important. The speaking is the listening is just as important part of the communication as the speaking is. Yes. Active listening. Yes. Active listening. Right. Like good eye contact, good body posture and, and stuff like that. Because I think especially a few focuses in therapy, but about two big focuses are uh, communication and self-worth. Communication, this is just skills mm-hmm. for the whole lifespan that's important to have. Self-worth, if you don't think you can do something, you're probably not going to try, but that's also going to probably have some kind of effect on the effort of which you put forth in something. And I think especially with um, communication, not and especially with everybody, but also especially men and, you know, especially, you know, black men, uh, two things. It's okay to say I'm not okay, mm. and you're not a burden. Yes, sir. These two Stay things. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, it's and, and I know you know for me, like in growing up, like you know, it's that kind of toxic southern masculinity of like, oh, you're crying, like I'll give you something to cry about, like rub oh. some dirt on it and stuff like that. To where it's like, hey, I could rub some dirt on it, then I get really anxious thinking people out thinking other people will think I look homeless. So like really not going to help. But I, but I think in that too, it's like, you know, and I think especially too, like with some parents, like um, they want, they want their kids to have like the best life possible. And I think that's great, but also they can still have the best life possible, but still experience negative emotions. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I allowing them to experience that is so important because if they don't, if they don't get the experience in dealing with the negative emotions, then they're never going to learn how to cope with it or coexist with that feeling. You have to learn how to process. Right. Process. That thing, yeah. Because, mm-hmm. because like skills unlearned or skills delayed could lead to more issues down the stretch versus helping them deal with what's going on right now. And I think kind of in that too, like for some kids, um, <clears throat> like let's say let's say they like throw, pitch in a fit or something like maybe something happened at school you know and you ask them like hey well, like, what's wrong I mean they're probably not going to give like some kind of articulate answer like I felt so misunderstood by Miss Smith she completely invalidated <laughs> invalidated me when I wanted these things but kind of in that too it's like sometimes a better and sometimes an easier answer for kids but also adults too it's like hey what do you need I can't I can't figure out what's wrong with me right now so I can't answer that Mm-hmm. But hey, I, I need a few minutes or I need some time outside just to breathe for a minute. Yeah. And I, and I think especially in that too with communication, um, especially if you're not used to communicating, over communicate for the sake of communication. What I mean by that is go ahead and get in the habit of giving a lot of details and a lot of context. Mm-hmm. That way we can develop some kind of happy medium for that. Because I think what happens is we all develop we're, we all had the potential to be volcanoes. We all build up, build up, build up, but then that's correct. We're kind of in that too. It's like when that when that happens, we're doing more damage control instead of fostering those connective bridges to the relationships with people that we love and care about. You know? I like that volcano uh, analogy. I'm gonna yeah. use. We have mm-hmm. to, we have to get it out. The more we get yeah. out, the less because right. sec- secrets kill. Yes, secrets right. uh, fester in us, and mm-hmm. they will eventually turn into an identity. And have us acting out in some type of behavior mm-hmm. because we're so frustrated 
and yeah. we can't communicate what's been uh, repressed, what's been held right. back. Right. And it, and especially like let's um, with certain like behaviors and like patterns that we see or experience from other people mm -hmm. by not communicating what you could be communicating is two things. It doesn't bother you mm -hmm. or that you're OK with it when neither of these may be true. Correct. Especially with men. Yeah. Uh, men Absolutely. are we are very we're we're prone to uh, uh, certain areas of uh, mental health uh, mm -hmm. uh, disorder such as substance abuse. Especially because of our ego and what's been right. enforced between uh, norms of society, as you said earlier. Hey, don't cry. Wipe your wipe. Your, it's I teach my son. It's okay to cry. It's yeah. okay um, mm -hmm. uh, to have bad emotions. Let's talk about the emotions rather than tuck them in. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. I think we have to normalize that men need to mm -hmm. articulate what yeah. they feel rather than not uh, talking to anybody about it. I, I normalize having a good support structure. How important mm -hmm. is a good support structure or somebody? I tell everybody this. <laughs> you have you should have three people in your life. Mm -hmm. One person that's smarter than you. In my case, uh, that's Pastor Simpson. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, one person that you walk with that you can, that's your confidant. Um, that's my case as a female right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's my well, it's my wife <laughs> right here, which you share. You know, they can walk yeah. through the struggle with you. And then one person that you pour into. So they don't model and fall into the traps mm -hmm. um, that you have fell in. Therefore, mm -hmm. it gives you some gratification. It builds confidence in you and the spirituality of man. How important is it to have a good support structure and a good self-care will in place to prevent mental health issues? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On, a, on support structure first, I think that is key. You know, God, God definitely created us to be communal beings. Like we weren't made to be isolated lone wolves in this world and in this life. And I think especially um, with the community, with the um, community too, like it is, it's absolutely key. Like I know for me, like the way in which I've been able to develop into like the man, the person, the, you know, husband, the therapist I am today, uh, first and foremost, God's will and God's grace. And then second, due to the um, tribe of people who have helped me kind of along the way, mm -hmm. you know, I, I did not get to where I am by myself. Like it's, you know, angel, angels working overtime, like people in my life who have just been pouring and investing in me like over the years. So like I, I, I take, I take credit for my physical presence here, but like all everything development here, it, it, part of it's been me, but a lot of it's been them. And I'm incredibly blessed for the people that I've been, I've been able to have in my life over the years. And, um, and I think kind of in that too, um, especially in being vulnerable in with, with community, especially like biblical, like Christian community, mm -hmm. um, allowing yourself to be carried, mm. especially in those seasons of like trials and like darkness and like valleys, mm -hmm. opening yourself up to other people so that you can receive the help, support, grace, and acceptance from them. Because I think, especially, um, I think especially like in the church, like we put on like this mask with other people my, my. to where to where it's like, like, hey, like, you know, falling apart on the inside, like walking to church. Oh, what's going on, brother? Like, hey, you're doing great. How y'all doing? So good to see you all. So we're in that too. One thing I tell every, everybody is like, you got to be careful to take down the mask because what happens if you put the mask on too long? Mm. One, it's impossible to maintain. But also too, you can be very quick to lose who you are behind the mask. Mm hmm. Because I think, and especially like as as people, but also as men, a lot of times men define themselves by what they do. Yes. So in that too, like let's say, like okay, like you know, like, hey, you know, brother, start event. Like who who are you? Like I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. I'm a counselor. I'm stuff like that. That says everything about who you, what you do. That says nothing That's about it. who you are. You are. I have no idea what your personality is like. I just know what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think. In that too, um, so like let's say for example, like I am confident, I am loving, I am nurturing, I am uh, optimistic, I am courageous. You can be all those things regardless of what you're doing. Because I think, because that's the thing too. Like if you if you always define yourself by what you do, what you what you do is always changing. To where if that's the sole way you define yourself you will never have a true solidified sense of who you are because it's always dependent on what the role is. Yes. Yes. I like that. So in that too, having that solidified sense of self, it's like, Hey, what I'm doing may be different, but I'm still me. I'm still carrying myself into 
whatever I do, not being swayed by the role itself. Because mm-hmm. I because I think in that too, you know, and even like in the roles of like parenthood and stuff like that, huge roles. Don't lose yourself to it. Oh my! Don't go in the cave. That's what no, I say. Absolutely not. Don't go in the cave. I tell my clients yeah. that all the time. Have have absolute honesty, and especially if you have a spouse, man. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said earlier, tell them, hey, I I just don't be afraid to say I need some time. Yeah, or, I absolutely. Don't want to talk right now, or right. no. Um, yeah, and men I, are yeah. notorious for going into the man cave, right? And taking all of the problems, all the frustrations yes. throughout the day. The I don't know, and we'll dwell in that cave, not only in the cave in a person, but in our mind. Yes. And we'll yeah. carry that frustration and act out. And then we're it caused comorbidities because right. that one mm-hmm. one issue will develop into a bigger issue. Yeah. And before you know it, that's how the devil works. He gets you maybe with shame on one side, on frustration mm-hmm. on another, and then you act upon that stimuli. Right. And it has you doing something else, and then you mm-hmm. have more shame and you're in a digger, a yeah. bigger hole. So right. stay out the cave. Yeah, yeah. And I think especially, too, like when people like do reach out, receiving the ladder of support that they provide and climbing up in that, too. And I think, you know, especially men, women, children, anybody in existence with mental health, (laughs) having having emotions and showing emotion does not make you weak. It makes you human. It makes you strong. Because even in that, too, like let's say we showed no emotion at all. uh, Essentially, we're robots with skin. That's That's what we have deduced ourselves to by not allowing ourselves to feel or show feeling or compassion. So I think in that too, it's like, um, you know, one thing I tell every comes to me, I'm like, I encourage you to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You got to mm. deal, you got to deal with, you got to deal with this comfort in order to get comfort, comfortable with it. And I think, especially in that too, going back to like the self care stuff, um, I've said this kind of in reflecting on my own like spiritual walk, but also like counseling journey. Over the years, um, I think growing up in the church, I've, it's been incredible. Like, I'm definitely grateful, again, for everybody that God's brought in my life. Um, but I think in that, too, one thing to be careful of is thinking self-care is selfish. Sure. Yeah, that's where in that, too. And I think one thing on this, too, um, there's a certain level of selfishness that is healthy. Oh, yeah. There's a certain level of selflessness that is unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, for anybody, you cannot give what you don't have. Because, like, if you're not, you know, and I'm the king of, like, cheesy analogies. Like, so think of it like an octopus. That's, I, I tell people, I say, if nothing else makes you feel better about yourself, it's my horrible drawings and cheesy analogies. So there's some self-worth just from the get-go. But, uh, but I think in that, too, like, thinking of it kind of like you're an, an octopus or whatever. Uh-huh. So we've got, like, let's say we got, um, we got, our, we got one in our job, in our marriage parenting, uh, church involvement, maybe sports team or like interest, da 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 da. We have all these we have all these arms going outwards, but we have none going inwards. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. We're in that too. Like and I think with self care but also setting setting good and healthy boundaries for yourself is always making sure that you have something coming in because if all you have is stuff going out, your tank's gonna run empty at some point to where mm-hmm. if you truly want to give something of substance to these things and these people, you have to be given to yourself. Cause if you don't give to yourself, you're giving off fumes. Mm-hmm. And I think in that too, like let's say you do need to pull back from some things for the sake of yourself. It doesn't make doesn't mean you're a jerk, it doesn't mean you're selfish. You're just trying to identify what moderation and goods and a healthy level of selfishness looks like. So that you can give more fully to those things, right? To those more kind of selected number of things, and I think with self care too, um, it looks like a lot of different things. So I've never, I'm grateful that I've never had any issue up to this point with drugs or alcohol. But what I joke and like seriously tell people, like, I'm a recovering workaholic, mm-hmm. um, to where, you know, especially with self care and like identifying limits. Like let's say like this is your limit, um. So it's better to acknowledge like, hey, I'm reaching my limit here versus I have like plowed through my limit and I am just shot. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, been, that's been me for the past 28 years. Past two years, I've gotten growth. I'm like, like everybody here, um, I'm a work in progress, not a work completed. Mm-hmm. Work completed happens on the other side of eternity. It doesn't happen in this lifetime. And if you think it does, you are sorely mistaken. Correct. Like 
working to always strive and refine and be the person that God has created you to be, but also continually staying working. Um, so I think in that too, you know, with the self-care, whatever, you know, whether it's like reading a book, exercise, working out. Um, I think even like too, just for me personally, unplugging from everything. Mm. Like, I mean, I'll keep my phone on me if people need me, but like not, no screens, no, you know, no emails, no texts, no none of that. that. And that's just for me what I need for me sometimes. Like I need to just not have any demands on me for just a few minutes just to breathe and just pray or even just exist for a minute. Because in that too, like that's that's healthy. I think to some degree, with as much media as we're not, as we're exposed to now, like it's unhealthy to be as plugged in to everything kind of as we are. Because mm-hmm. so media think, does form it, it, it forms our thoughts in many yeah. ways. If, if, yeah. we, if we don't watch it, if we right. don't uh, allow or, uh, or or restrain things that we're subjected to, our, mm-hmm. um, our emotional state, healthy and negative emotions, they are always going in our head and we have to right. be uh very conscious to play the tape through. I think you made some great, great points. Mm-hmm. Um and you said one thing that I want to annotate, stick a thumbtack in. Mm-hmm. Um it's an ongoing process. Yes. Many yes. times we go to a therapist and get to a point to where we see some deliverance, some progression, and then we stop. No, mm-hmm. it's a continuous thing because yeah. there always be things to work upon. Right. Um, and again I think it's helpful that you intertwine your pastor mm-hmm. and your therapist. Yeah, absolutely. That's just me. That's just my thought and my theory. I yeah, think it could that's thing too. It, like, you know, yeah, yeah. It, mm-hmm. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and like we discussed before too, it's like the presence of, you know, issues and problems or some kind of mental distress does not mean the absence of God in your life. God, God, no, God is with you even in the midst even in the midst of the mental stresses and turmoils and struggles that you face, he, you know, cause he, he created the mind. So why would he not? And I think in that too, like with, especially the stigma of just mental health in general and like getting help for that, you know, we, we pray for healing and we pray for rest, like in the physical body, but in that too, we got to take care of the mental body because what, what it, what is, whatever the state of the mental body is, it can have a direct correlation with the physical. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. N- n- none of these are isolated. No, they all work together. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, protagonist and antagonist. Uh, right, some, absolutely. I mean, and an unstable-minded man is unstable mm-hmm. in all his ways. Yeah. Uh, so, you again, it's a constant work in that self-care. Yes. Uh, we could go on for days, brother. Could, yeah. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I enjoyed you. Definitely going to keep your number and keep in contact. We, we yeah. thank you for coming on. We're going to open up just for questions because yeah, I don't want to hold them too long. Mm-hmm. But uh, right now, uh, for those of you watching, again, we thank you for coming on. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please go ahead and ask. We'll open up for two or three questions um, and allow Brother Krebs uh, to answer them. If any other question, again, man, I thank you for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you guys. It's been an honor and pleasure. They just don't know the whole time I've been breathing, yeah. <laughs> control my my state. Yeah, <laughs> it's nothing like preaching. I think preaching is easier, uh, or talking to a client in a one-on-one setting is pretty much easier than uh, doing this. Yeah, yeah. And that a thousand yeah. people are watching on the other side. We got one right here, bro. <laughs> yeah, here we go. All right. So, how do you? Oh, three minutes. I got All it. Right, um. Okay. So, how do you help someone with disorders or illnesses without hindering them? Yeah. Incredible question. Um, one thing I tell a lot of people too, like, especially if they have like friends and family who are also struggling with things, I think it is very important to identify your limitations. Mm. So we're kind of in that too. Like, let's say, um, like, let's say for my own mental health issues, like my wife, like she can be amazing. She can be supportive, help me, support me the best she can, but there's only such, there's only so much she can do within her limitations. Right, like to where I could think kind of in that too. And even like for our own well being, like let's say we have um let's say we have like somebody with like significant mental health issues and they like come to us like because they're trying to make us their like therapist or whatever, but we're just friends. That's a limitation with our relationship. Is like, hey, like, hey, like I'm here to support you the best I can, but there's only a certain there's only a certain range in which I'm willing to go, but also can go with you. Not because I don't care about you or love you. If anything, this is why I'm telling you this. 
but there's only a certain level of support and help that I can provide. But here is information for other people who can help you with that other area and that next realm of help Great. for that. And I think on one, um, for anybody listening, but also anybody to, um, as far as like looking at therapists, trying to preview therapists without actually seeing them, um, Psychology Today is an incredible website psychologytoday.com like that's an online directory where you can look up uh cities like it'll show you like therapists from different cities you can look up a specific therapist mm -hmm. and it'll kind of take you to their profile if they have one on psychology today so if you're like even thinking about therapy like in places near you highly recommend that site if you want to just kind of check out people's pages their practice websites and stuff like that but kind of going back to the uh question a second ago you know acknowledge your limitations Love, love them with compassion, but also in that too, um, as far as hindering them in their mental illness, I think, you know, do what you can to help, but also it's also if they have questions for you and even like me as a therapist, like it's okay to say, I don't know. Yes. Yes. Cause that's the thing too, like, you don't, you don't want to give faulty advice for something you're not trained in or that you know about, but you can't help guide them and lead them to the next stepping stone for helping them reach that wellness in my so, opinion good. that's one sign of one great i'm sorry to cut you off yeah you're good in my opinion that's one sign of one great clinician when he or she is able to admit an area in which she does not specialize mm -hmm. and redirects you yeah that, means that person cares mm -hmm. we're taught yeah. that school is an ethical practice mm -hmm. to, right. to dwell in the realm that that fits you that you're confident in hey direct them out <laughs> yeah absolutely because that's like somebody, if somebody were to come, I've never had experience eating with eating disorders. So I can help them with anxiety and depression. But as far as um, as far as eating disorders, I would have to refer them out to somebody who has experience with it. I got one more question. Is okay. there a difference um, between a mental breakdown hmm. and depression? Or how can you tell the difference? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, really good question. So I guess and I haven't really thought co compare contrast with that um, to <laughs> just again I don't know um, I, but I think like in, initial thoughts of that I think mental breakdown could be maybe kind of like what you were saying a uh, pastor event like a, a culmination of the issues building up over time and kind of that explosion just that breakdown mm -hmm. um, to where just everything kind of like spirals and is out of control. And I think uh, depression could be very similar to that, but it also could be kind of the, the more subtle aspects of it. Um, so I, I think it would just, I guess it would probably have to have more context and depending on the person, but I think the full on mental breakdown could be kind of that too, like trying to like keep, keep the build up kind of under wraps for so long. And then it just finally explodes uh, coming out. So yeah. initial compare and contrast, that's, that would be my answer. Well, thank you so, so much again, mm -hmm. Brother Krebs, for coming on and ex expounding on mental health and making us aware of, of all these things, man. We were blessed to have you, and hopefully we'll have you back again. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Any Anytime. And, uh, and also, too, like, if you guys uh, want to, feel free to, you know, <laughs> some people always get hesitant about this. Um, feel, feel free to, like, share my email and, like, my email with, with any of you guys if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. about therapy or like whatever like happy to you know happy you know if you need therapy if i'm able to see you happy to see you um but if you need help getting connected with someone whatever i can do to help help connect you in that as well and i know brother start event brother simpson like they'll do whatever they can on their part as well so however i can help serve the body body of christ you know given given the calling which i have happy to do so thank you again brother Craig. we yeah. bless you man absolutely appreciate you guys all right good night all right good night thank you again for all who've come uh to all my ladies i just got a quick few announcements i wish hopefully that you can make it on tomorrow and get in at wednesdays at 7 a.m with lady chelsea the weekly prayer she's a keeper ministry if you don't have that please go ahead and screenshot that ladies and men we're not excluding the men it's all inclusive um, I know she's going to drop some jewels as she does every morning because I know because I have several people that I talk to that are blessed. I'm a, I need to get on there myself. And uh, we also have 
The Community Health, Nutrition, and Wellness Fair, June 3rd, 2023, location, Selma Mall parking lot. Um, this is uh, spearheaded by Danita Allen, as well as uh, some of the ministers and uh, Second Ministry, Missionary Baptist Church in general. Uh, we're going to be out doing all kind of great things as far as in health checks, blood pressure check, diabetes checks, and um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some ministry there. So uh, come on out. Please patronize. Tell a friend. Bring a friend. Uh, don't just talk about it. Be about it. Come out and see us and uh, be uh, check on one part of your health. And then we have another one. Sunday, Monday. I'm sorry. Sunday, May 28th. Pentecost Sunday at 12.30 p.m. GKC. Pastor Davon Simpson, yours, our pastor, uh, will be at 2902 North Broad Street, Selma, Alabama, 36701. And he will be there. And the host is uh, Apostle W. Channing Jackson at the Greater Missionary Fa Church Family. All right, Pentecost Sunday. All right, all right. And again, um, I would, again, be remiss without extending you uh, the opportunity to be a part of this great fellowship. Come on. If you don't have a church home, uh, a place where you call home, you are invited to come here. Come on back. God loves you. And he's waiting on you with open arms. Um, my pastor, Davon Simpson, Lady Chester Simpson, uh, will be delighted to lead you and help make you a disciple in this great body of Christ. The kingdom work and fellowship is open. Labor. It's, it's a lot. We got a lot of labor here, you know, and we need some workers. So come on, be a part of us. Join this train, mighty train. Um, and if you don't know Christ, now is the time uh, to get out of the cave, get out of the frustration, get out of the loss, get out of the mental ill funk, get out of wherever you are. If it's not joined with the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ, this is your opportunity. You can drop your name in the comments. You can give us a call. You can uh, email. You can write a letter. You can staple a letter and slide it underneath the door here's your time to come and be a part of the body of christ uh, and all you got to do is just say god i believe that you are my savior and that you redeem me from the pits of hell and because of your blood i am saved and covered and i have been redeemed and i believe upon you as my father my my ruler my creator and i love you and i want to be in your family if you say that right now you've been saved and all you got to do is just come on in and, and start uh, with us and be a disciple and get with a body of Christ to be built and developed in the right way by a good man. I can attest to that. He is a good man and a spirit filled man. And he's backed by a solid. I'm sorry. She stands beside him. A solid uh, lady, Chelsea Simpson, and got some great ministers and great uh, patrons and, and, and disciples in this body of Christ. All right. We thank you for joining. Come back again and hope to see you this Sunday. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Good night.